Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Travis McGrath. I'm the Director of Customer Success here at Exago. And thanks for joining us on today's Support Lab. I'm really excited about this lab. Uh, we're gonna talk about troubleshooting with the integration of Exago and all the different ways it can be connected and extensibility. There are areas where things may you know, be misconnected or need some investigation. And we're gonna give you some tips and tricks on how to do that. And I'm really excited because I say we, I'm joined by my colleague, Liam Smith, a veteran of our Exago support team. Many of you may have worked with him in the past. Uh, so I'm excited as I'll be covering the first part of the lab and then Liam will be uh, wrapping up with some details from the side of our support team. Just to make sure everyone can hear me okay, uh, you are on mute. In the GoToWebinar panel on the right side of your screen, there's a question box. As always, if you can give us a yes, a thumbs up, a short story about your day, whatever you want there, perfect. I see some questions coming in so everyone can hear me and see my screen. Uh, well, let's dive right into it. So first, as always, just an overview, what are we gonna cover today? So we're gonna start out by talking about key concepts of troubleshooting. This will be a little abstract, uh, but the goal here is to give you some guidelines for how to identify and resolve issues on your own. And then we're gonna talk about errors and log files and where to find things in order to garner more information and insight into what's happening behind the scenes in Exago if something's going wrong. And then Liam's gonna talk about support tickets. So that is, when you do need to escalate something to Exago, uh, how to best do that, what the process is like, and a little bit of the life cycle, what happens behind the scenes. So very excited for that. Awesome. Can you hear me? So we're just gonna dive right in. So first of all, key concepts. Uh, the first thing with any issue, if you see a report behaving oddly or you know something's not working or you're getting an error message, is replication. Can we make that happen again? Is it uh, a one-off issue? Not to say that we can investigate one-off issues, but consistent and replicated issues are certainly a lot easier to uh, see and address. Then we want to be able to simplify. So if we have a huge dashboard with many reports and we're getting you know, a generic error somewhere, we want to be able to simplify it down uh, so into its smallest steps. And then the last piece is we want to target it. And I'll talk about what we mean by that in just a little bit. So these are the three concepts we want to keep in mind. So first, replication. What do we mean by that? So we want to verify the desired behavior. We want to make sure we understand uh, what we expect to have happen to make sure that you know we have the right set of expectations. Then we want to list our steps prior to the issue. Uh, so this is key. If you know we have many, many, many steps, uh, we want to have them all clearly laid out. What this does is it helps us identify areas for what could be causing the issue. Uh, so this may be as simple as I executed a report but maybe we can rebuild the report or you know, go through those steps again. And then we wanna replicate it. Can we get it to happen consistently? All right, so replication, pretty simple. And as I say simple, uh, funny choice of word there, the next thing we wanna do is simplify it. So if we have a list of steps to make something happen, we wanna look and say, can this be done in fewer steps? Is there anything here we can take out? That'll help identify and isolate, you know, where the issue may be occurring. Uh, beyond that, we want to say, is this specific to a report, maybe a data object? If it's a UI issue, maybe is it specific to a browser? Uh, we want to simplify not only the steps to make something happen, but any specific, you know, features or details that we can say this only happens when. Right? The closer we can get it to a very narrow uh, steps to replicate, and the simpler it can be, the easier it is to identify with eliminate more possibilities of what could be happening. And particularly, that goes not only for is it specific to reports or data objects, but can any features be removed? So if we're using maybe a server or action event extensibility features we've talked about in past labs, could we disable those and see if the issue still happens? Often, 
trying to disable a feature and seeing that an issue no longer happens helps us really simplify and, and target the issue. And with that, the last step is then target. So once we have a simple case, you know, uh, that's something we can replicate, we have more of a concept of what kind of issue it is and where to investigate. So I've broken it down into a couple of categories. These aren't totally encompassing, right? There may be issues that fall outside of these, but generally, uh, we want to target it. Is it an API issue? Is there something happening with a permission not being set? Is it a data issue? Is my report returning something I'm not expecting? Uh, is it an execution issue? As I run a report, am I getting an error? Extensibility being you know, custom functions, folder management, server and action events. We've talked about a lot of extensibility in our technical lab series previously. Or is it a UI issue? Maybe a dialog looks kind of funny or uh, maybe something isn't launching. So once we target that, we can have different steps to dive in and get more information. And I'm going to talk about each of these in just a moment. Uh, but beyond that, the other thing to keep in mind here is, are there any environmental changes? Did I switch from one server to another? Is this a new installation of Exago? Uh, maybe I didn't bring over a language or a config file. Um, did I just recently update, right? any environmental changes to the server or the, the Exago instance, or even maybe the host application instance could have an impact, right? So we want to target not only the type of issue, but surrounding changes as well. And then, of course, did we get an error message and do we need or, or have some more information? Um, this is something we'll talk about in just a little bit as well. Uh, sometimes if you see an issue in Exago, uh, you know, a report execution stops and it says an error has occurred, we're going to want to get more information on that and we're going to talk about how to do it. Before I dive any deeper, so the replication, simplify, and target, does anyone have any questions there so far? Okay, no questions so far. I will say this lab is going to be a little in the abstract. You know, we're talking about many different types of issues. So as we go through these, some of them may apply to you. Some of them may be things you haven't seen. Don't worry too much about that. Um, if you're on a lab here about troubleshooting, you've likely worked with, with software before and you know understand how each of these can, can come into play. OK, so first up, we want to target the API. And the way we can do that is twofold. First, we can debug our code. If you were on with us at the um, API lab, we did one on the .NET and REST API, we actually did exactly this. We added a debugger launch to our host application's code right before it instantiated a session with Exago, and then we stepped through all the things our API code did to make sure each one was successful. We didn't get an error message somewhere along the way, preventing the application from launching. The other thing we could do is at the end of our code, so this is something we can do at the start, but at the end of our code, if we want to, we can use this method, API.SaveData true. And this is a method that will tell Exago to take the effective configuration file, that is the config file that we loaded up as we started our session, plus all the API changes we made, and save that file as an XML file. This is something you don't want to do in a production environment, of course, but in a staging environment, you can make a backup of your regular config, and then you could use this method and see all the changes that are being made. You could then compare those two files and see the effective changes of your API calls. And you could see, oh, maybe I thought I was activating a role, but my code didn't activate that role as I thought it did. And you could see that in that config file uh, that's generated by this method. So these are two ways we can debug our uh, API. Like always, I'm using our .NET example, but the same concepts here are going to apply to REST as well. OK, so beyond our API, we may have issues around our data. Maybe uh, I'm not seeing the data I expect, or maybe I'm seeing more data than I expected, uh, and I want to find out why. So the first thing to do is look at the report, and specifically, we covered advanced joins uh, very recently in one of our support labs. 
So look at the advanced joins menu, make sure all the joins in the report are what we expect. In the admin console, we can look at data objects, we can look at filters or different filter screens as we build reports, uh, roles, multi-tenanting. These are actually all things we've covered in previous support labs, so I'm not gonna go into detail here, but looking at each of these individually, you may see something that you weren't expecting. Maybe somebody added a filter on your report, or you added a filter on your report that uh, you know was filtering the data in a different way. Uh, but let's say you look at all these and you're pretty happy. You think all your data objects are set up, all the joins are what you want, uh, you know, you don't have any additional filters. The other thing we can do here is we can use a uh, server event. There's a global event called on execute SQL statement constructed. And in this event, we can actually see the SQL that's being generated by Exago when it queries the data source. Uh, the way we can do that is we can build a server event and it is passed in that SQL from Exago. And we can just throw that up in a user message, or we can log that to a file. This SQL statement will also be written to our log file, talk about our log files in a little bit, but this is an easy sort of shortcut for that. Um, if you want to see this server event or you want to actually build this server event in your environment, we have an article in our knowledge base on our support site where uh, this event is listed. And as always, all of our support labs are recorded. When this one is posted up, we'll have a link to that article here as well. Uh, so you can either just search for it. If you search SQL, you'll probably find it. Uh, but we'll also have a post here as well. Okay, so we talked about the API. We talked about data. And then we can talk about extensibility. This is one of my favorites. So the extensibility features have, a lot, because they're customizations, you want to be able to verify two things. One, is the code you're putting in place being reached? Uh, so with custom functions, those are probably going to be reached, no problem. But with server and action events and folder management methods, uh, specifically, it helps we can add a debugger in our code, and we can see, oh, maybe this debugger never got called, so my action event isn't enabled. Or maybe this debugger is called, and I want to verify the right session info is available. Uh, and then beyond that, we can, once we have these debuggers in place, we can step by step through our code and see where the error occurred, and that should help us identify, again, we want to target that issue uh, down to you know, its root cause. If you can't debug into one of your extensibility features, the other option here is you can add logging. So into your code uh, for the extensibility feature, you can add to the log file. Um, in this case, I'm using uh, an example from folder management but we could also have uh, the same lines here in our um, server events or uh, custom functions, anything that's server side. On the client side, for example, in an action event, you could do the same concept, but instead of using a debugger like this, in JavaScript, there's just a debug method, and you could add that to the JavaScript of your action event as well. Okay, great. So that's extensibility. Uh, so here's the, the line of code I mentioned before. And then finally, if you have a UI issue, uh, there are a couple of things we want to do. One, we want to clear the browser's cache. Uh, occasionally, uh, you may find a caching issue, in particular if you've just updated, clearing the browser's cache may have resolved that issue for you. Uh, the other thing we can do is we can use F12 to open up uh, the dev tools. And this is, uh, I'm using Chrome here, but the same thing will work in Firefox, i.e. any major browser. And we can check the browser's console for JavaScript errors. If we're seeing a UI issue, it always helps to look to see if there's errors here. Uh, so clearing the browser's cache and then checking for errors. Great, so that's gonna cover how we can target different types of issues. Those are gonna be steps we can take based on you know, our replication and our simplification, we can then say what type of issue is it, and we can go even further with those steps outlined in targeting. The next thing you might say is, well, I got a generic error message. You know, I ran a report, all I saw was this dialogue that says an error occurred, contact your admin, you know, what do I do? Uh, and what's happening there, we're not showing the error detail. And this is a design point in Exoto, 
is that if an error occurs, we have this message. You can change from an admin perspective. You can use the language files to change the text of that message. But as an admin, you may not want to see that generic error message. You may want to show the full error detail. Uh, so we can do that in the UI, and I'll cover how that's done in just a moment. Additionally, we can do that in the when error occurs. We can look in the log file uh, of Exomni, and I'll talk about both those things in a little more detail. So here, uh, we want to show the error detail, and we don't. We want to show this instead of that generic. Um, so the first thing we want to do is if you're navigating directly to Exomni. Now note, in a production environment, you really shouldn't ever be doing this. But in your local environment, uh, if you're working with something in a staging environment, uh, you may go directly to Exomni. Uh, and what you can do is you can just append this line here, question mark, show error detail equal true, to the URL in question, and that will uh, tell Exago as it launches, if an error occurs, don't show the generic error message. Instead, give me my full error detail. Give me the full stack trace. Uh, the other thing you can do is for using the API to launch Exago, when you instantiate an API call, uh, you give it the path to Exago, and then there's an optional Boolean setting here uh, called show error detail, and you set this to true. Generally, the default there is that it's false, we don't show those error messages by default, but we could set this to true. One neat thing here is because you're using the API, you could have this in your production environment set to true for admins, but set to false for everyone else. And I'm showing the .NET example, again, as you instantiate REST, uh, you know, as you do that first session post, if you're using REST, you can set the same, the same flag exists. Um, what this will do is it'll say, as you launch Exago through the API, if an error occurs, show the full error detail. So in these two ways, we don't have to go to the log file to see a stack trace if we're getting a generic error message. One note, when this lab is posted, we do have an article outlining this and giving a little more detail here. So if you're interested in setting this up in your own environment, you can, again, in our knowledge base, either just search show error detail or when this lab is posted, we'll have a link to it below the video as well. So the other thing here is the log file. So in Exago's admin console, we have uh, a setting called write log file. You can set this to none. You may do that in a prod environment just for performance if you don't want to worry about logging. Most of our clients will set this to error uh, if they are just working sort of day-to-day -day running Exago, it will only log error messages. But if you're diving into an issue and you want full information, you can move down this drop-down list. So none will give you no logging, error will give you only errors, warnings, information, and full debug gives as much logging as Exago has available. Ask where's this log file live? And so uh, this log file is going to be called uh, webreports.log and it's gonna live wherever the temp path in your admin console is set. There is a way to customize the log file. I'm not gonna go into that in too much detail here. If you're using that, you probably are already a little deeper than we're going in terms of the logging here in our lab, and you have an understanding of where your logs and error messages are gonna reside. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is if you're using the scheduler or remote execution, because those may be on a different server, uh, the scheduler instances have their own log files. Great. Um, so with that, actually, I'm just gonna introduce, once again, my colleague, Liam Smith. So Liam, are you on? Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah, I can I'll hear you. Let us yes. <laughs> All right. Other folks are coming along. So, uh, Liam, I will click through the slides for you here, uh, and just let me know uh, when you want to move forward. 
All right, great. Uh, so, uh, so Travis has walked you all through uh, 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 getting to the point where um, you should be able to essentially solve most problems um, within your environment. Um, however, uh, let's say uh, you, you run into an issue that goes beyond that, and, and all of your troubleshooting uh, skills that you've learned here, um, uh, they, they don't, they're, they're not pushing this, uh, pushing this forward. So in this case, you've done all the troubleshooting you can, you've read the documentation, um, and you think you've simplified uh, the case exactly, or uh, simplified your question uh, as far as it can be. Um, uh, 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 so what next? Uh, in that case, you're going to want to escalate to support. Um, so to escalate to support, you're going to want to open a ticket. And what I've done here is you should see uh, what our support por portal looks like. Um, this user, J Jerf Kerperkus, uh, <laughs> he he has a couple options open to him. Uh, so here we have, uh, you can ask a question, you can request a feature, and you can report an issue. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to really only cover uh, asking questions and uh, 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 reporting issues. Um, uh, requesting a feature is a whole another beast. Okay, so these two ticket types, uh, questions and issues. Um, questions, in our mind, uh, should remain uh, re uh, solely on functionality or where to find information. Uh, for this case, we keep that ticket form uh, quite simple. Um, there's just a few pieces of information that we ask and then, uh, and then a, a, a ticket body that you can fill out your question in. Um, if what you're looking for goes beyond that, now we're looking into an issue ticket. Um, the issue submission form is uh, asked for quite a bit more information, um, and uh, some of which is required, and, and there's a good reason for that, which uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get into momentarily. Um, so really the big purpose of asking all that information uh, in the issue ticket uh, blends into this ticket life cycle. Um, so, uh, you can move on here. Yeah, we got triage. So when a ticket comes in, uh, it, it goes directly into uh, a, a essentially a bucket of tickets uh, that that all of uh, our support team has access to. Um, about twice a day, uh, the support team meets uh, to go over those tickets, um, and we will uh, disperse them among the team. And here's where the importance of that issue submission form uh, comes in. Uh, if we get it, uh, it, when we're distributing the load across the team, we need to know uh, whose expertise would be would be best uh, would best fit the ticket that's submitted, um, and uh, that submission form gives us an idea of where the ticket is going to go. So, for instance, um, uh, one of the questions is: Is this a, a production environment or is this a staging environment? If it's a production environment, we know that the priority is going to be a bit higher. We know we're going to want to jump quicker to a call. Um, we also ask uh, what operating system you're, you're working in, in. And if it's, say, Ubuntu, we'll, we'll know who on the support team will have the expertise to, to help you uh, uh, in the quickest way uh, possible. Liam, could I add one more sure. piece there? Or even maybe ask a question of you to make sure I'm understanding that right? Sure. Sure. One of the things, uh, at least I a long time ago, uh, worked on the support team as well. One of the things that could make tickets take longer than they might need to is having to do additional triage uh, with the client, right? So having as much uh, information and also simplified processes, targeted information uh, in that initial step allows the support team as they do triage to uh, resolve the issue faster as well. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, that, uh, that's a, a solid point. Um, giving us as, uh, as much information as you have um, it, it will always help us expedite uh, a, an issue ticket. OK, so uh, we can move on to on-ticket communication. So um, on-ticket communication is usually done in a, a text back and forth. We try to be as prompt as possible. Uh, I, I, it, I, I'm sure all of you can uh, understand. We're, we're all in software. Uh, we we know that uh, a ticket load can can vary um, uh, 
day to day. So some days it can be uh, greater, some days it can be less. Uh, we really do strive to have at least a first response out to uh, to the ticket within 24 hours. Um, generally, it's more, uh, but uh, we we definitely will have our our, our first responses out uh, as quickly as possible. I think you mean generally it's less. Uh, sorry, yeah, yeah, good point. <laughs> no problem. Um, uh, so, uh, so uh, moving on, uh, we we have our uh, the next stage of our ticket is a solution or a replication. So the idea here is um, we will uh, if we if the if the steps to replicate are simple enough and we're able to do that here, um, we can we can either provide a workaround, a solution, or uh, we can post that issue within our system. And uh, once that happens, things go into uh, an, a, what we call an internal on hold state. Uh, the on hold state will, uh, uh, it, it means that this issue has been sent to our development team for an estimation. Um, and from there, uh, we will keep that ticket open in that state until the issue is, uh, is addressed by, uh, by a code change. Okay, so let's uh, let's hit the next slide here. Uh, we can keep going. Yeah. So uh, sometimes a ticket isn't just as simple as here's some steps. Uh, go go uh, verify that my issue is an issue. Um, in many cases, we cannot uh, replicate that behavior here due to some limitation or some difference in environments. Um, so one thing that helps us a heck of a lot is uh, debug packages. And what that essentially is, is a small uh, sliver of your data, as well as uh, the report file and uh, the con and configuration. This will allow us to see if maybe if it's a data issue, or maybe if it is a report design issue, or, or some sort of configuration issue. Um, and there are a couple ways to get us debug packages. Uh, the, the main way to do that is via automatic submission. Um, what you see here is uh, what you'll see within the ticket. So admins will have to set a, uh, a debug password. Um, then uh, you can select this report from uh, the folder tree and then hit Control, Shift, and X, and that should show this submission form. Uh, from there, we'll ask you to put in that password that the admin set. Um, you can put in the ticket ID, which, uh, which is present right on the ticket uh, that you've opened up and then your contact information. From there, the report should run, and uh, it should automatically attach it to our, our ticket. Liam, I hear you saying the word should there. If a user's uh, or a client's uh, server firewall doesn't permit it, there's an alternative method, I take it? Yes, <laughs> that's actually uh, the next step on this slide. All right, so there's manual submission. So there's some situations where you can't, we can't get an automatic submission. Uh, sometimes certain keystrokes are blocked in your browser, in your environment. Uh, sometimes a firewall is blocking it. Uh, there are a whole mess of different reasons. So this one is a bit more involved. Um, this requires a, a, a quite a bit more uh, work on the admin side. Um, so first you'll have to create a folder called debug in the root Exago install folder on, on the web applications uh, server. Um, from there, you can, uh, it, from there, uh, you would have to then go into the admin console and uh, there should be a setting called enable debugging. You would set that to true. Um, we don't recommend doing this in a production environment. Um, it can have uh, a, a multiple, it can cause a multiple multitude of uh, kind of small issues, uh, uh, mainly around performance, but uh, there, there are some changes we make um, to the UI uh, that, that, that are very visible. And um, Liam, but, one of the changes you're mentioning is in the right-hand corner, you'll see a red box that says debug mode enabled as though it's a very severe warning. So if you do yes. have debug, debugging enabled, you'll see that in the bottom right corner. You shouldn't see that in a production environment, basically. A yeah. No. Yeah. So if you see that in your environment, um, it, it's uh, it's not recommended uh, for production. Um, 
uh, so anyway, where was I? Uh, yeah. Actually, Liam, so, uh, sorry to jump in. Uh, we just had a great question. Uh, and they said, could you create and submit debug packages without turning on debug mode and getting that red debug status in the, in the right hand corner? Um, so the answer is yes. So if you, if you use that first mention here, the automatic submission, uh, you just have to set a debug password and then you don't have to have that uh, debug mode enabled for that manual submission. Yeah, good point. Um, so all right, so uh, once, once enable debugging is turned, it's turned on and that folder is created, um, at this point, all you need to do is run the problematic report uh, in the Exago UI and uh, or uh, a question to question report in the Exago UI and in that debug folder it will create all of the files we need for a debug package. So at that point we would ask that you uh, zip those all up into a single uh, file and attach it manually to the ticket itself. Um, that should uh, those those steps uh, should address. I want to say 90 to 95 percent of issues. There are some cases that have gone further, um, and I, uh, I believe there uh, there are some folks on the on the line here that I see uh, that we have run into cases like that. Um, but it should cover most cases, and that should allow us to uh, to address most issues. So, Liam, let me make sure uh, just as as a closing here to wrap mm -hmm. uh, the. Things I talked about at the beginning, you know, replicating, simplifying, and targeting issues will help clients, first of all, help themselves in discover, you know, uh, settings or missed connections or maybe extensibility issues uh, and resolve them on their own. But if they do run to a point where they're stuck, they submit a support ticket and they use those same steps to deliver as much information as possible to the support team. And then from there, the ticket life cycle is that it goes into triage. The support team takes an initial look. Some things will be uh, issues we've seen, you know, someone else run into before. We'll have an immediate answer and we'll send over a solution on communication. There may be some back and forth in a ticket to ask more questions, to get more details, to try possible solutions. Uh, and then if the support team is able to replicate it, uh, they will, you know, uh, escalate the issue to our dev team, you know, we'll get it into a bug fix in the future. Again, based on priority, and all those things. If they're not able to replicate it, they would then request a debug package. And in that case, what you're showing here would be uh, useful to the support team to have more details and a better shot at replicating the issue so we can get it resolved. Yeah, all right, that sounds, that sounds pretty complete there. Awesome. Um, so with that, we're just going to, uh, oh, sorry, I didn't click down on these two for you. Um, so with that, uh, we're going to wrap up and uh, and just say, you know, thanks for attending. Um, for everyone there, we just passed the bottom of the hour. Um, at the end of the webinar, as you close out, you'll be prompted to do a survey. If you would, we always appreciate it. And particularly, if you have ideas for future lab topics, let us know. Uh, we're looking for some topics specifically for next month. In May, we'll have more topics around our 19.1 release, but we want to know what you, what you folks who are attending these webinars want to see coming in April. Um, so with that, I'll say on behalf of Liam and myself, thank you and happy reporting.